Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this session, I am Vera Sajrawi. First of all, I'm a Palestinian journalist born in Nazareth, based in Haifa. Uh, I, uh, I'm talking to you now from Haifa. Uh, we have to remind people of the history, would like to remind people of the history of Haifa. It's a uh, one of the most bustling uh, Palestinian cities before uh, 48. Um, it, uh, it's on the Mediterranean shore. Uh, it was occupied. My uh, maternal uh, grandparents uh, lived here and were uh, kicked out of their house to the port of Haifa, put on ship and shipped to Lebanon, uh, to Saida. And uh, they sneaked back uh, after a few months uh, to find their house occupied uh, by uh, new Zionist settlers. And uh, that's how I was born in my uh, grandfather's uh, original village near Nazareth. And uh, today I'm renting a place in Haifa from an Israeli woman. Um, so that's a little brief history where uh, I'm uh, calling from. Uh, in this session, we'll talk to Palestinian journalists uh, uh, about the coverage of the genocide. Uh, we will talk to uh, uh, Palestinian Gaza born and raised, uh, Jamila Tawfiq, who covered uh, the first few months of this um, genocide in Gaza and who can share her story uh, with us in details. Uh, we're also talking to Shuruq Asad. Shuruq is uh, talking to us from Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. Uh, she's a veteran journalist, I might say, and she will share um, the experience of covering the occupied uh, Palestinian uh, territories, uh, especially Jerusalem and West Bank, for the last 30 plus years. Uh, welcome, Jamile wa Shuruq. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's start uh, with uh, Jamile. First of all, I hope your family and friends and everyone you know in Gaza are safe, continue to be safe, and uh, we're holding them in our hearts. Uh, please tell us about your experience covering this genocide when it started. Okay, so uh, first of all, my, uh, my family is in Egypt, thankfully. We have left... Uh, at the end of January, and uh, then my sister and brother followed, but uh, my brother-in-law is still in Gaza, so hopefully he will come out soon, as, as soon as uh, the Rafah crossing opens again. Uh, covering the war was one of the hardest experiences I've ever ex lived in, in my life, uh, especially that it was my first time to be live on the ground. So as a journalist, I've worked uh, as a freelance journalist with different websites and as a writer. But as a reporter on the ground, it was my first experience. The hardest, but uh, I believe it was, it was, it, it influenced me a lot and taught me a lot because no one, no one could imagine how, how hard uh, that work could you have lived many wars in Gaza, but that one was different in everything. Since the 7th of October, uh, we felt that this is going to be different. So I started after uh, two days uh, in the war. I started with Al Jazeera English, and uh, everything was so hectic, and it was like everything I saw on TV was actually live. So it was hard for me to, to make sense of everything and to know how to deliver this message uh, to the world. But it was a huge responsibility. So we started 
and we had to evacuate multiple times because it was very dangerous. They were hitting all the areas we were in, in the middle of Gaza. And every place we evacuated to was targeted. So it was a lot to take. And um, I remember one time we were uh, covering at a, a Shifa hospital. It was one of the hardest times. But I believe the hardest days were the best somehow. Like they gave me an opportunity to deliver the best message. Like we were standing there for like three, four hours. Uh, it was continuous, nonstop. And the communications were shut down completely. We couldn't reach any of our colleagues or our family members. Uh, so you can imagine you're in the middle of the hospital. People are coming in all the time in, in, in uh, ambulances or in, in cars. They were coming in, in huge numbers. There were genocides happening. I remember that it was the first day of the genocide. And when I was alive, I was, I, I said this word, I said genocide, like uh, Israel has just committed many genocides in, in different places in Gaza. And then I remember my brother was calling me and he was like, no, you shouldn't say genocide. But it was a genocide. Like whole families were wiped off uh, of, of Gaza. So it was crazy. So I, uh, after the live, I remember I, I started crying. I couldn't take it. Like we're human. Okay, we're journalists, but we can just collapse and take take our time to make sense of it. But when I had the next live, I stood there. I wiped off my tears and I just delivered the message. Like I saw my my family in the faces of those people. Like what if those were my family members? What could I have done? But I'm a journalist. I have a, a message to deliver, and I knew that there were many people watching live. So the least I can do is to speak the truth. What's happening on the ground right now? It was hard, and uh, it affected me uh, physically uh, and in, in many, many ways, but I believe it was the best thing I've ever done, like to have such a great responsibility and to, to see that. I, I remember Vera was very helpful to me at that time, like I needed uh, all the words of comfort that you're doing well, uh, you can do it. it. It wasn't easy at all. Uh, and I feel so sorry, but so proud of everyone who are still there in Gaza, journalists exactly. Like I have friends there who are still covering the war. And I can't imagine how are they still doing it. Like it's easy to see someone standing in front of a camera live, like, yeah, you can do it. It's not, it's not a difficult job. No, it is. It's harder than we can imagine. And, uh, I just, I, I found myself in that place, no matter how hard it is, but I knew that this is the thing that I can do. And there's nothing, there, there's nothing better than this job for me. Like I found myself in, in being a reporter, no matter how hard it was for us to, 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 to cover these wars, but uh, it was the best experience, no matter what. Jamila, t tell us if you want also about how hard it was to get out of Gaza. Tell us about yeah. additional hardship Gazans go through. Okay, this is, um, this is a very complicated topic. Uh, People who were able to leave Gaza, they have to pay huge amounts of money to the Egyptian side to leave. So it wasn't easy. And it took a lot of time just to get accepted in this, uh, in this thing, just to leave Gaza. No one, it wasn't easy for anyone to leave. So, uh, we paid huge amounts of money just to save our own lives. And after a struggle of like two months, about two months, uh, we left eventually, and 
Uh, I know people who actually paid to, to save their lives and they couldn't leave until now. And even after the Rafah crossing was uh, destroyed and now not no one can leave Gaza, uh, people are trapped there even after paying money. So it's like you 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 sold everything just to get the the required amount of money to to save your own life to get out of your homeland. So it's the idea itself is is crazy. Like we were forced to leave our home, our 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 hometown, and to leave to Egypt, but it, we were also being humiliated. So after paying money and being humiliated to leave our our home, uh, we knew that there was no way back. Like even after, even if Gaza comes back again or whatever happens, we can't go back to Gaza. This is uh, the difficult truth. And um, the struggle is, it was really difficult as a journey and, and we, we left without saying goodbye to anyone because each of my family members were in a different uh, place in Gaza. Uh, it, it was very heartbreaking and uh, we felt that that was it. There's no no coming back, and we were saying goodbye to everything. It was a very difficult decision, but it was the only thing we could do after spending more than four months in the war. It was continuous. The death was death was getting closer to us. We couldn't take it anymore, and. That's why I don't blame anyone who left Gaza uh, because they had no other choice. Like, they wanted to save their own lives. And this was the only way, even if it cost, it cost them, like, huge amounts of money. But, uh, yeah, that was it. Thank you so much for sharing. I know it's difficult. Thank you. You're Let me go to Shuruq. Shuruk, tell us where you're talking to us from and what's your experience as a Palestinian journalist covering the genocide that is happening really like what, how far is uh, Ramallah from Gaza? A couple of hours? If there were no... An hour. No an hour. An hour. Yeah. Jerusalem, to Ramallah. Jerusalem, Ramallah to Gaza is only one hour. Yeah. So I want to, to thank uh, Jamila. Uh, each time I hear our colleagues, we can call them the genocide survivors, talk about their experience. I say we have nearly 2 million uh, stories, personal experiences uh, on what really happened inside uh, Gaza and Jamila is one of them. And I want to thank you, Vera, and thank uh, everybody who are watching uh, us. And I want to say, Jamila, too, that I hear this word uh, from all my colleagues who were obliged by force to leave their beloved city, Gaza. Uh, and for people who don't really know Gaza, uh, Gaza is a very beautiful city on the Mediterranean Sea. It was a very important harbor even before the establishment and the occupation uh, came uh, to Palestine. Um, uh, I, I They always say we did not want to leave, but we were obliged. Yes, you were obliged and we understand. And uh, nobody has to defend uh, him or herself. And I know Jamila from all my colleagues that they are in very hard situation in Egypt. I know this very well. They are there uh, connected totally daily with their loved ones inside Gaza. Um, detached, no work, so many of them. Uh, they are really in very hard circumstances. Uh, concerning following the, the genocide from Ramallah and, um, and Jerusalem, I have to indicate that for, I've been a journalist since 30 years, and I covered other wars uh, in Gaza, even this war for especially the first two, three months from Asqalan, from the border. 
And I covered the, the war on Lebanon. I stayed like a month uh, in uh, Jalil. Um, I covered so many incidents, but I have to admit and that this is the deadliest uh, incident that we have to cover, whether we were inside Gaza or outside Gaza. Um, first of all, uh, try, uh, we are we are you know, Israel is banning us from entering Gaza to cover. So our colleagues inside Gaza are they are our eyes and senses. They are our source of information there, and they are doing this bravely, uh, no matter even the very hard circumstances of of bombing of like 1,500 displaced, uh, starvation, uh, lack of water, uh, living in tents, uh, displaced for six or eight time, uh, losing 14% of the number of our colleagues there. We lost till now nearly one, 152, according to, to PGS. Uh, 88 uh, offices were bombed totally destroyed those offices. Our colleagues were threatened in Gaza. And after 24 hours or 40, 48 hours, their homes were shelled or they died or they lost others. They could not even get medical treatment. We lost so many that we could have saved their lives. So many things to say about those hard uh, circumstances they are in. We tried to cover the war from the borders. We were attacked uh, those in, in those incidents, and we used to stay, like, to be gathered together, like a Palestinian journalists with foreign press and Israelis sometimes. Uh, they just come to attack us, only us, the Palestinian journalists, uh, threatening us that we, uh, we have to leave, that uh, I have a colleague that they even threaten him to, if they would see him, they will put a, a bullet in, in front of his head. And um, they circulated his picture. And once we were covering in Babel Hamoud in Jerusalem, they came and they beaten him and they said, we don't want to see journalists. Uh, you are the problem in this, uh, all that is happening. And anyway, we all know that this attack on journalists is not new. I have to insist on this. It is not new. We lost since the, the year 2000 till 6th of October, two, uh, 55 journalists dead, killed by Israeli army. Three of them were foreign journalists. There was reports, 10,000 reports of attacks. This means nearly three to four attacks daily in West Bank from Israeli army and settlers uh, the year between the year 2012 till 6th of October. Uh, so it is not uh, it is not new, but we, we saw acceleration. There was high more violence uh, against journalists. And we know that uh, narrative is one of the things that Israel doesn't want. It doesn't want another narrative, uh, which is Palestinian. So for Israel, uh, usually when we wear the safety vests and helmets and TV stickers, According to international law, in any other place in the world, journalists should be protected. In Gaza and West Bank, but Gaza more brutally, this means for Israel that we have to kill those people. We have to silence them. And this is what is happening. Uh, in West Bank, I've been covering after we, we decided not to stay on the borders anymore because it was really dangerous and we were threatened and uh, we then there was no picture anyway. They started even to um, put us in a corner. So and even we were very afraid from settlers, armed settlers, to be frank. They were very dangerous, attacking us. And usually the Israeli army and soldiers do not protect us anyway when soldiers attack us, neither near Nablus nor near Hebron or Bethlehem or even Jerusalem. And you will be surprised that in the syndicate, we reported from our colleagues nearly 200 attacks on journalists. The most number of attacks, the 200, were in Jerusalem by settlers and by Israeli army. Uh, then we have Jenin, the other, and then Nablus, Tulkarem, Bethlehem, Ramallah. And, you know, we have daily invasions now in the West Bank. Uh, Israeli army invaded the homes of of nearly 70 of our colleagues. Uh, there are others in Gaza too. They were all arrested. 
we have nearly seven uh, journalists uh, who are who were arrested in the Israeli jails, and they are in very very hard circumstances. They are beaten. They are starved. Uh, they are under administrative atta- uh, arrest. This means that they they are not introduced to any uh, court, uh, no file. We cannot visit them. We don't know anything about them. Still, till now, we have fifty one still in the Israeli jails. I, I went to visit um, a colleague of mine month uh, a month ago. And he lost, he stayed two months in prison just for under the violation of freedom of speech, only for what they wrote. They don't have any other accusation. He lost 20 kilos. And uh, he was telling things, he was even afraid. He didn't want to do any interview with me because he was afraid that he will they will come and take him another time to the jail. Uh, the, the total number of attacks in the syndicate, we can say it's nearly 350 attacks uh, in the West Bank. Uh, we have nearly 70 attacks from settlers. Uh, this means that we, we say that this means demolishing equipment, humiliation, uh, threats, uh, shooting, uh, injuring, uh, tear gas uh, forbidden us to 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 reach to areas in checkpoints. You know that West Bank after the seventh of October, there's five hundred checkpoints. They are terrible. Five hundred checkpoints and gates all over the Palestinian cities and refugee camps and villages. It's very hard to reach. Any I used to go from Ramallah to Jerusalem, nearly forty minutes. I will be there maximum one hour on the checkpoint. Now it can take me three hours to reach. Uh, I don't want to take long talking about everything, but I can say that, um, in my opinion, and we are preparing in the in the PGS files, uh, Israel has to be accountable for what it's doing to us as journalists and our colleagues. Uh, I have also to say that we have so many injured by life bullets uh, of our colleagues uh, because they attack us. Yani we are together usually away from demonstrators and, and and soldiers, but they attack us every time, every time without accountability. And we are preparing files to go to the ICC because I think Israel has to be punished. Uh, either the politicians who took orders or the soldiers who bombed or shot journalists or made them starved or displaced or, or interrogated. Or uh, I think this is very important. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to answer any questions there. Thank you. Shuruk, how does that make you feel to be in the eye of the sniper and the, uh, under the violence of both settlers and army? It's something that I I can only describe is fear. I feel afraid a lot. Yani, each time I go to visit, I think several times whether I will go back home safe or not, whether I will be attacked or not, whether they will uh, burn my car or not, whether they will arrest me or not. I, I've, I'm very afraid about for my cameraman, for example, because sometimes we reporter can be, but he has to be more near the pictures. It's it's very frightening, but you feel it's you feel angry too you really feel angry that your life is not precious. You are living under military orders. Uh, they are kind of a gang. And you'll be just filming and they can attack you out of the blue and and there is nobody to protect you. The idea of protection, which is our uh, simple right as journalists, it's, it's not implemented for us, neither in Gaza nor in the West Bank. It, it makes me feel very angry, very unsafe, very afraid, actually. But also, also, I can say we learned a lot from our colleagues in Gaza, a lot, how to work uh, under these circumstances that you are a target. You're not just you're not just covering the news. You are yourself as a journalist. You are a tar- target. How to go on, how to, the importance of delivering the story. Uh, to do your best to deliver the story. Uh, my husband got shot uh, the, when there was the prisoner swap the first months of the, the war. And he was in Alford prison. He works with Sky News. 
And we were all with Al Jazeera, TRT, Jordanian TV, all of us. We were gathered on a uh, hill very far away from Alfer prison and from the families. And soldiers came at night and they shot him while he was filming. And the sniper shot him a bullet here and two bullets came to the car. It was very good that he really went down. And he had two two broken ribs here. It was very, and I remember Jivara and we all got really, we could not breathe. Um, we lose people, we lose, Yani. we're all, I think all my colleagues, we've been doing a mental health course uh, a couple of days ago. There's the big trauma, direct trauma in Gaza. And we are the, how you call it, pre-trauma. Yani. We're traumatized from all the, and each time I send a message for a colleague in Gaza and they do not answer and I stay for hours or for days. I, I don't know if they are alive, if they are dead. When they call me and yesterday a, a colleague was telling me, Shuruk, because you know what happened with Rafah after they were displaced and then Al-Mawasi. So they, they even lost them the tents they did. And there is nothing in the local market. And she said, Shuruk, anything, just let anybody bring us any cover where I can sit. And she's a journalist who lost her husband too, with four children, four children with kidney problems now, with liver problems because of the polluted water. Uh, my family, my husband's family are all inside Gaza. Only his mom managed to go out. Uh, and they lost 70 of, of their, their family. And each day we're living emergency. And trying every day to check about our journalists what we can help them, how they are living. So this trauma is, we are taking the trauma. And also we know that things in the West Bank are not good and maybe things will be harder the coming, uh, the coming days. So what I feel is that I feel afraid. I feel full of injustice, but I know the importance of my work. So that's why I, I think our stories are very important. And I say without our colleagues in West Bank and in Gaza, we would not have known about so many massacres and stories uh, that are happening in Gaza and all the incidents that are happening in, uh, in West Bank. Wow, Shuruk, thank you so much. And uh, I hope that your husband fully recovered and that he's doing better. Uh, Jamila, let me come back to you and ask you a question that I, I struggle with. Um, I've lived um, in the U.S. for a while. I, I've lived outside of uh, historic Palestine, and um, I always missed it, and I always wanted to be on the ground to cover how do you feel about your journal? If you can share about your journalistic work now, uh, and how do you feel about covering Gaza from far? How important is it? Covering uh, the war on the ground is completely different from trying to cover it or cover the stories uh, when you're far away. Now I'm in Turkey, I'm so far away, I'm still contacting my friends and I'm trying to share and write stories of, of the people there, whether martyr stories or people who are still trying to write uh, and, and see what's happening in Gaza. Uh, it's not easy. And as Luke has said, it's very important about the, the trauma we're facing. So as Palestinians, and especially in the West Bank or in Gaza, uh, we have always suffered from the PTSD. And these traumas are so hard to, to hear from. Uh, and I, I haven't yet uh, talked to any therapist or anything, uh, but even if I think I want to, someday if I want to talk to a therapist, where should I start from? Uh, from all the words I've lived in my life, I've lived words um, from 2000, 2008, 2012, like all I can remember, all my memories are related to war. So this is really traumatizing, it's so sick. And uh, even if you're still so far away from Gaza and you've left this place, 
it feels like you're living in a parallel uh, reality, like far away from the real place you're supposed to be in. And it's so hard to 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 make sense of everything you've lived and, and trying to feel that you're a normal person, that you can keep going in your life and, and get over everything. It's not easy at all. But uh, we we chose this this job for a reason. Like it is important, as Ruth said. Like I'm, I'm doing something for a purpose, and I believe in it. That's the most important thing. And uh, and now it's it's a bit different for me. Like it hits me different, and I try as much as I can to to do my best. Like this is the least I can do for now. Okay, I left. Uh, but yes, I can still uh, raise their voices, deliver their messages, speak the truth for them. But it's still, it's nothing uh, compared to what they're doing there. For my, I'm speaking for my journalist friends who are still covering, who are still there. Uh, for my friends who are uh, still in, in staying in tents or uh, people who have lost their beloved ones or their family members. So for me, I feel lucky enough that, okay, um, my situation is, is a bit better, but it gives me the opportunity to, to do the things they were not able to do, like to do something for them and to keep talking about what, what's happening because it's, it's not stopping. Like we know that the 7th of October is, uh, is much more of its, it goes back very far away from it. For all the years we've, we've suffered as, as Palestinians. So it's a consequence of everything we've lived. And, uh, but, but the consequences now, like now it's been nine months in the war and it's getting worse by each day. We've, we're hearing genocides happening every day in different parts in Gaza, in the South. It's not stopping. It's getting worse and no one can do anything about it. So. What we can do is just to keep talking about it, keep doing what we can do so the world can just be there, you know, just listen to what's happening, uh, to try to do something, to change something. Can I add, Jamila, something also, if, you, if, if it's okay about what you're saying? Sure. The problem is that we are the fourth generation of an Nakba, right? We're already holding the trauma. We're all refugees. And I'm a refugee from Jerusalem. Exactly. I'm from Mila, of course, Vera. So we already have this trauma from our parents and grandparents. And for Jamila, 18 years, she's been working in 18 years of brutal military Israeli siege on Gaza. So she's not even been in, she, she wasn't really living a normal life before this genocide. It's it's year after year, it's 76 years, years with escalation of this trauma and loss and fear and genocide and killing and uh, and the same in West Bank, no matter it varies. But this is like an any, it's a process, I mean, uh years. Of, of since 48, with all the incidents we lived till the 18 year siege on Gaza and all the work, the hard work our colleagues been doing and trying to work. And then we're, we're here now with this, Yani. I just wanted to add on what Jamila is saying. Maybe the, the worst thing uh, about being from Gaza and had to live all of these wars that, um, by the way, I'm 27 years, so um, 1997, I was born in 1997. I've lived 2000 war, uh, 2008 and all the other wars, but this one was just different. Uh, and as I said, what I can remember are memories related to war. And of course, from the stories of my grandmother and my parents. But the worst thing is that we were as if we were, we used to to have this period of war and our life, like every year, there was an escalation, there was war, like for a couple of days. So it was really hard to live with this. Like every year we were hearing sounds of missiles and explosions and 
bombings. And you're like, okay, the war has just started. As if we got used to it, and this is so ironic, but so sad. As if our lives uh, are getting used to this idea of being okay, uh, living in war constantly. Even our kids have lived like many wars. I, my nieces, my nephews have lived multiple wars until now, and they're only seven or six years, so it's crazy. Like, is this normal? Absolutely not. And now when, when we were obliged to, to leave Gaza for good, uh, and my parents are saying like, Halas, this is, this is it. We're not going back to Gaza. We can't go through this again and again after everything we've been through. So now I keep thinking like, is this really it? Am I supposed to live this new life, uh, in, in a whole different place, trying to, to feel like, okay, this is the normal life I was supposed to live from long ago. Not that life that was full of wars and, and horrible things. So it's really crazy. And it's hard to, to explain this to someone who hasn't lived it before. Like, it's, it's just hard. Yes. Um. I'm really interested in talking about another hard and painful topic, uh, which is the bias of the international media coverage. Uh, I've worked with channels like Reuters and the BBC, where the coverage wasn't fair for Palestinians, but it wasn't as bad as it is in this genocide. So... Um, as journalists who worked with international media, I want to ask you about your critique, your opinion, and how it makes you feel to watch all these international uh, uh, channels uh, and agencies and, and, and websites not give a fair coverage of the ongoing uh, genocide. Shuruk, maybe we can start with you. Yani this is very a topic. Yeah, and it's very, very, very hard topic actually for so many reasons. I followed uh, I followed a lot the foreign media and international uh, media how they covered Gaza. The irony is that those the West have been lecturing us for years about freedom of speech and human rights, and how to have two side stories, and how to have ethical journalism, and how to investigate your information, everything. And they did the opposite, totally the opposite. The first two, three months, they were spokespeople of the IDF. They were literally spokespeople of the Israeli army, grabbing every story, putting them on air broadcast for an hour and two military people uh, without even investigating all the videos and information that turned out to be a lie at the end. Yani bombing the party turned out to be a lie and that the Israeli army did it, uh, the rape, the cutting heads, all those stories. Um, there was no ethical journalism. There was no two side stories at all. Yani at the beginning, I was watching BBC, CNN, ABC, Fox News, uh, France 2, whatever you want. They can, yani they will bring an hour with the spokesperson of uh, the IDF. And maybe after the first month, maybe they will give two minutes for somebody. And sometimes they won't, or they will let them keep on defending themselves that they are. There's a background. There is, of course, they did not present any historical background about Palestine. That Gaza was under 18 years of siege. Palestine has been under 67 years of of occupation. All, all the violation happening towards Palestinians. Uh, nothing at all. As if 7th of October went down from the parachute. Uh, Though we have to say that we, we will be never happy for the killing of anybody in as a human being. But there is there is a story, there's there's history, there is the right of resistance. This is in the international law. There is the right of, of uh, defending yourself. 
uh, this wasn't did not apply as if it's a for as human rights and international law as if it's a for certain DNA people. There was dehumanization, a lot dehumanization, as if in Gaza there are there's no women, there's no doctors, there's no teachers, there's no uh, normal people. They are all uh, terrorists between brackets. And even animals, they even said they, we are animals. And nobody said this shouldn't happen. And this vocabulary shouldn't be used. There was even this story about as if it's a war between, and they all fell in it, as if it was a story, as if it was a war between the white, civilized, uh, Christian West and the colored Muslim Palestinians Arabs. and. Th- I remember that uh, there was my colleague, for example, uh, Nada Abdus Samad from BBC, who was fired for what she wrote. You know, they fired in 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 several um, media. Uh, they used to call, for example, the the Palestinian the Palestinian the Israeli child. He's a victim. Palestinian child. He's not a victim. I covered the the swap of prisoners. Not any single reporter from any international, American, European television in Jerusalem went to do a human story about the Palestinian children who were out of jail and swapped with Israeli children. They all went uh, to the Israeli families and nobody did a story. Nobody did about the now it's 10,000 Palestinians kidnapped in the Israeli jails. From 7th of October, add this on the more than 8,000 Palestinians. They are kidnapped. So, I don't know, There was they tried to change after some months. But uh, still, Palestinians defend themselves. Still now, journalists call me and they say, are you sure they are journalists, the ones who are killed and shelled? Are you sure they are doctors? Are you sure they are bombed? Are you sure? It's it's insane, actually. How does that make you feel? It's, uh, you know, it made me, to be frank, and I I don't really, I want to say frankly what I feel, I have disrespect. I have disrespect for all this international reaction, whether it was in journalism or in politics. I even uh, have, I don't have any trust with the ethics they used to lecture us and the ethics they think they are, uh, they have. Um, And I don't believe them anymore. And I think they have to defend themselves for us. They have to defend themselves for us. Why they did not stand for our rights to defend ourselves, for our right to resist, for our right as human beings, and for international law. Why? And even for now, for accountability. So for me, I used to have little trust in them anyways. But I never thought that they will see all this genocide coming out from Gaza that we did not see all over the world, and they will still repeat the same language unethically, unhuman, unprofessional. Uh, So I don't really, I have no respect for them. And I think they are part in this genocide because words are like bullets. They can mislead people, they might kill, and they will participate in not stopping this uh, as 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 giving Israel bombs the same and military aid and so on. It is the same. Words are dangerous at this, to this point. And in my opinion, who did not really stand out clearly, uh, they are parts in this genocide for me. You mean people who didn't make their position clear towards what's happening? No, I say first, we talk about media, all journalists, when they did not really give and investigate the story and give its mm-hmm. background and so on. They are parts in it. And I cannot say that people who stayed silent may be parts, but they are kind of parts. They are kind of... Because we live, I, I believe that we we are all in this planet as human beings. I saw them how they stood for Ukraine. Mm-hmm. 
and, and not even 5% of what happened in Gaza, not even 2% happened in, uh, in Ukraine. And I saw them, what they did and what they are doing till now. So anybody who really did not do anything are parts. They are parts, no matter, I don't know, but in my opinion, they are parts. And it varies from how, what, and so on, and who are they and what they did, but uh, they are parts. And the people who really stood hard and went on the streets, and even I have journalist colleagues who, who had fought hard with their editors to publish stories and so on, I, I tell them thank you, Yanni, because this really means a lot. And it tells that uh, this is not only attack on Palestinians, on journalists, on doctors, on people, on homes, on neighborhoods. It's attack on, hum on humanity, Yanni. If they don't stand out, this means we are really in, 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 in a very sad position. I mean, as human beings. Yeah, the hypocrisy and the complicity uh, is crazy, unhinged. I don't know what to call it even. It's, it's very enraging. Uh, Jamila, I would like to direct the same question to you. Uh, what do you think of the international media coverage of the genocide and how does it make you feel? Uh, as Shuruk said, every part who hasn't been, been clear in their voice and in their message, they are definitely part of it. And it's, it's really unbelievable. Uh, the whole international media uh, is a lie. We've been told something and when we, we saw something completely different. Uh, and the only question is why? Uh, because clearly there's something wrong. And, um, and I've seen the good thing, uh, it's not about the international media, the good, the good thing on, uh, on social media in general that how Palestinian people or pro-Palestine uh, Palestinian people are trying to share videos and speak about what's happening in Gaza on the ground. Uh, they're trying artificial videos to, to tell stories. And this has helped a lot in sharing our, uh, our truth. Like, we're not victims at all. We have a right to defend that this is our land. This is what's happening to us. We've lost everything. But we're not victims. This is a misconception that the world sees us as uh, victims and we need help. No, we don't need, need help. <laughs> we have a right to defend our lands in, in any way we can. And, uh, and, and I've seen many interviews uh, with uh, people who were hosted in, in BBC or in different international media platforms uh, Basim Yusuf, uh, Mustafa Barwoti, who were completely shut down. They tried to, to speak the truth. They were silenced and uh, they were assaulted. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Like, this is happening. Uh, people are seeing this. What's the point of, of trying to defend something that is, complete, that is completely not true? Uh, so, yes, they are complicit in this. And they're hiding the truth, plain sight, in plain sight. And um, they're, of course, they're, they're being supported in trying to do so. So, uh, I don't know, I, I'm trying, I always try to think about this and find a reason of why is it it's still happening until now, after everything uh, that is still going on in Gaza, and it's been going on for a long time, uh, and, and they still won't speak the truth. Like what's holding them? What what's wrong with us? And why why have been why they have been trying to use this dehumanization uh, phrases about us in terms like it's really disrespectful and and it makes you feel like you've been you've been seeing the truth completely different and this world is really 
it's really it's unfair what's happening to us, but it's it's also a challenge for us as journalists, as young people from Palestine who are trying to to speak the truth. It's a challenge to to keep uh, speaking the truth against them. So it doesn't matter. Like they can keep speaking and whatever they want, but we're still here. We can keep uh, telling stories about. Uh, what happened to us, and it will just we will tell it to our to our children, and we won't stop, no matter what. I would like just to add that it's not just Western international media that was exactly. not. Uh, also we have. Our, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, yeah. Which which is double the disappointment for me because you would think geographical proximity or sharing the same culture and heritage uh, will have these media uh, outlets uh, be more uh, symp sympathetic towards Palestinians. But unfortunately, we have many Arabic channels that are not covering the genocide um in uh, they're covering it in a very biased way i have to say yeah. which means they're uh, part of it this yeah, is totally I, true. this I, is totally true and um i think this this genocide and war on gaza there are things that we all knew before even uh and so very clear but after this genocide as if things were white or black. Those uh, unreal reactions about humanity and uh, our rights politically and identity and, and so on, it reached to a point that it's very clear Absolutely. Uh, as we uh, are uh, near the end of this eye-opening session, uh, I would like uh, to give uh, Jamila and Sharuk the floor to talk about anything that we haven't touched on, uh, whether as a journalist or a Palestinian woman, whatever you would like to highlight to international audiences, valued and welcome. Jamie, um, uh, Shruk, maybe we start with you. Okay. Um, yes, I would like to say that uh, usually women pay higher price in wars. In wars, usually, for so many reasons. Though the experience in Gaza gave us lessons about gender, actually, because we saw um, men. I don't know, crying, men cooking, uh, boys taking care of, of young children, uh, women really working hard in other stuff, which is wasn't stereotyped. They really gave us lessons. Uh, but I still say that the women, women in Gaza pay, pay higher price. And especially, for example, I have two of my friends who became pregnant, knew they were pregnant at the beginning of war. And they were terrified from the war, but they were more terrified because how they will really take care of this baby, um, whether to get food or to reach to hospital or give birth. And they told me about stories how doctors removed, they were terrified that they may reach to a point that because they had to take uterus uh, of women because not because they want, but because they wanted to save their lives when they had bleeding and there was no option for the doctors. And they were terrified and having nightmares about this, that this may happen for them. And um, so I always think about women, about their health, about how they are managing things, responsibility. Usually they are more attached to the details of their families and children and elderly and so on. Beside doing their works, their work as journalists, as doctors, as others. So I have to say that I think about women a lot. I, of course, men are paying price too. And of course, yes, 
but I know I'm a woman, I'm a mother, I'm, um, I, I know I know how hard it will be for them to maintain their their normal life. Beside my colleagues who are doing great job as uh, female journalists that we lost, as you know, 20 of them till now, unfortunately, with their kids. And the end thing I want to say is that I really hope that we will not lose another another person, another child, another journalist. And I want to see Israel going to court and I want them to see punished for what really happened. I know this will not really give us back the lives people lost and the traumas and the misery and all, all this destruction, but but at least they have to be punished for this. I also uh, join my voice to yours and hope and pray that we don't see any other uh, Palestinian killed. Um, Jamila, would you like to say anything? I just want to say that if, if this war has taught us anything, it taught us how to be stronger, more resilient and to have more patience, you know. Uh, we're such we're such great warriors. Like no one is like Palestinians. So yeah, that's it. And thank you so much. Yeah, I want to thank you a lot, Yani, Jamila and Vera and everybody. Yeah. I'm so happy if I recall the name right. Thank you very much. I know this wasn't easy and uh, the discussion was amazing. Everything you said is valued and and, and it's witnessing uh, the genocide. And uh, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And allow me to introduce the next session. We have a round table with Palestinian artists in the US, uh, which will uh, be moderated by Alissa Haddad Chin and Adam M. Um, Qasim. Uh, 